Okay, I'm going to give you guys my brief and biased history of the camera. Before I start, though, I think that it's important for us all to just understand how cameras have shaped how we have seen the world, and the development of photographic technologies has continued to alter our perception of both the past as well as the present. So this lecture is going to be a little bit of a supplement to the photo history that you'll be doing in your textbook this week, but hopefully, you know, we'll go more in depth in, in a lot of stuff and it'll build layers upon your knowledge of the history of, you know, both uh, photography and the technology that, you know, has pushed it forward. So the first thing that we should do is, uh, you know, think about where we are now. And when I say we, I, I mean, you know, us privileged people in the West that all are walking around or a lot of us are walking around with, you know, uh, cell phones in our pockets that have, you know, high quality digital cameras attached to them. And we're able to just pull them out at any time and just make our images. So, you know, it's important to think about how the cell phone camera has altered how we as a culture make, view, and understand images. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge shift in, in photography. There's more photographs being made, you know, in one day in the state of California than, are, than were made in the first hundred years of the medium. Uh, you know, that's a huge thing. And, you know, if you think about it on the big scale of things, photography is a pretty, pretty new medium still, right? So the cell phone camera is definitely going to leave its uh, imprint on the medium. So before photography was invented, you know, people still wanted to capture likenesses of themselves and their family members. It's not like photography invented the, the, the desire to, get to, you know, capture a likeness of your loved ones, right? This was something that existed. This desire existed before photography. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, to have a painting commissioned, you know, of your, you know, commission a painter to paint a portrait of you or one of your loved ones, that wasn't available to a lot of people. That wasn't a very, you know, democratic thing. That was, that was only available to the upper class, where silhouettes were something that were a lot more affordable and a lot more people could, you know, have made and something they could hold on to and remember a, you know, a specific moment in time of somebody's life. You know, it could have been their mother before they aged or, you know, any, any number of, of relatives. So, you know, in the 17th, 18th and 19th century, early 19th century, having your silhouette made was, was a pretty big thing. And I actually even remember I didn't, I wasn't in kindergarten in the 17th, 18th, or 19th century, but when I was in kindergarten, I remember that, that we actually did this, and, you know, my mom still has the silhouette version of, you know, five-year-old Buzzy in her attic somewhere. I think that's an interesting thing that has kind of stuck around. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to probably murder this word right now, but let's give it a try. So, in the, you know, 17th, 18th century, it was a huge thing. We had these Sisonotrace. <laughs> I said that wrong, but I'm sure that you guys can figure it out. Um, artists who would, you know, any commoner could, com you know, save up some money and go commission a silhouette made of themselves, which is a pretty interesting thing. It was like a proto -photo photograph. So the one piece, the one tool that, you know, predates photography that had influenced the invention of the medium the most is the uh, camera obscura or the dark chamber. And the camera obscura has been in use since the Renaissance. It was used as a drawing tool. So you would have these dark rooms that, that artists could move around and it had a small aperture in it, as you can see in the middle of this photograph. And through that small aperture, light would travel through it and project the image of what's outside of the box onto the wall upside down. And then the artist could go inside of the camera obscura and actually trace what was being projected on that wall and then paint over it. So here's a, uh, here's a smaller version of a camera obscura and an artist drawing, you know, f from, from what he has se is seeing in it. And this is actually, you know, the first one was an early camera obscura without a lens where it was just a pinhole, where this one has a lens and could make a sharper image. Another important moment... Uh, in pre-photography history was when uh, Jonathan Herschel Schultz, Schultz uh, figured out the chemical action of light on silver salts. Notice that silver salts 
under direct light would oxidize and turn turn black would would darken you know he was not a photographer was never made a photograph but that that bit of information will you know be pushed forward and used a hundred years after his invention or after his discovery and so you know a hundred years later here we have uh, Neeps who made the first recorded photograph and so here it is on the here's the actual photograph on the right and here is the like scanned retouched image on the left this is actually a photograph taken out of his bedroom window um, and you know the thing with Neeps is he was he made the first photograph but he couldn't figure out how to how to fix the image how to how to uh, not have the image fade so this is actually probably not the first photograph ever made this is the first one that didn't deteriorate to the point of being unread um, but you know and I've seen seen this in real life and it you know in this photo on the right that's actually more readable than it really looks in real life but you know pretty fascinating thing that you know, in 1826, you know, here Neeps was making making this image and something that would, you know, then lead to the next discoveries in photography. So in the 1930s, what we think of as photography now, which is an image fixed on a sub substrate that can be viewed and doesn't deteriorate, was invented by two people in you know roughly the same period of time and it's not really clear who came up with it first but they were both very different processes so we have William Henry Henry Fox Talbot and then we have Louis de Geer um, they both invented different processes to capture images um, and one was reproducible and one was not so first we'll look at the daguerreotype that was developed by de Geer he, it was announced, his uh, daguerreotype was announced to the world on January 7th, 1839. And the daguerreotype process is actually done on silver-plated uh, plates, plates of silver, that are then fumed over iodine and uh, exposed, and then, and then uh, exposed to a, a mercury vapor which actually causes the uh, iodine to eat through the silver and f make shadows. And they're actually very beautiful things. I mean, if you see one in real life, it's uh, it's almost like a mirror. It's like a really mirrored surface. Like this version that we're looking at right here um, kind of doesn't look like what a daguerreotype really looks like. In real life, you'll, you can actually see your reflection as the viewer looking at it. It's a pretty fascinating process, but it's a, it's a one-of-a-kind process. So you make... The daguerreotype, it's on a, you know, it's on a silver plate, and that's it. You can't make, you know, reproductions of it. That's one, it's a one-of-one one process. So here's an example of one of Daguerre's uh, early daguerreotypes, and this is actually the first documented photograph of a person. And it's actually kind of interesting what the person's doing. The person's actually down here. Uh, he's standing there, and he's actually getting his shoes shined. So it's kind of fascinating because if you look at this scene, it's not that the street was empty. There was just nobody out except for the shoe shine and the guy getting his shoes shined. It's that the exposures were so long because all of these early photographic processes, the emulsion, was not very light sensitive. This exposure could have been up to, you know, 15 minutes to make. So... It's not that there wasn't other people in the scene. This was probably a very busy street. There were probably people coming and going all over the place, but nobody stood still for the full 15 minutes except for the guy getting his shoes shined. So you can even see the person that's shining his shoes is is pretty blurred because they're moving. So this was a very involved process, and I mentioned, you know, you fume the plate. you you got to coat the plate in silver. Then you have to fume it over iodine. Then you have to bathe it in a mercury vapors and that's what all of this equipment is so on the left you have the camera in the middle you have the mercury pot which is fuming the plate and then on the right you have the uh, the iodine bath and so you've you know put your plate in that little holder slide it over the iodine fumes iodine the plate and then you expose it and develop it over mercury pretty crazy process there's still people that uh, do this process uh, today
but it's you know very expensive and very caustic chemistry, obviously. So then we're going to talk about William Henry Fox Talbot's uh, process. So he made salted paper prints, and so he made negatives, just like we think of negatives today. You know, when we go and shoot a roll of film, and we end up with negatives, and then we can print them into positives. So you know, Fox Talbot's negatives were paper negatives, and then they were contact printed onto onto salted paper and so here's a good example of on the left you have the negative which is called a calotype which is made as a paper negative a paper that's coated in silver and then on the right you have the salt print print which is paper that's covered in salts photographic salts and and then float it into a, a bath of silver nitrate, and then the negative is put on top. Once the silver nitrate is dried, the negative is put on top of the light-sensitive paper and exposed to light, and you have a uh, the positive of it. So when we think about you know the beginning of photography, it was kind of like Fox Talbot won out the contest because because his images were being were being able to be reproduced. That was a very important thing because we already had things like painting where we made a one of one. We had the one precious object. People were interested in having the reproducible object. And so that's why, you know, if you ask a lot of people who invented photography, Fox Talbot's name will come up. And that's who a lot of people assume, you know, oh, that's who invented photography. But it's actually, you know, pretty similar time frame in different parts of the world that these two processes were invented. And both, you know, most people in the know will credit both of them with the invention of, you know, uh, higher quality photography. And so then we're going to zoom forward to 1851 where Frederick Scott Archer invented the wet plate collodion process. Wet plate collodion process actually uh, has had a huge revival lately. Um, you know, tintypes and ambrotypes and all of that stuff. If you guys, you know, are out there in the world or going to museums or going to shows, you probably see artists that are, you know, continuing to use this process. It was a, it was a, um, you know, it's a, it was a lot easier of a process to master than both the daguerreotype or the salt printing process. And how you did it was you took a glass plate or a black tin plate and you poured this stuff called collodion over it. And collodion is like a glue. It's like a, um, yeah, I mean, it's like a glue. With an inside of the glue, there's photographic salts. And then you take before the glue dries, you dip the plate into a sensitizing bath of silver nitrate. And then before the plate dry, you pull the plate out of the silver nitrate, load it in your camera. And you have about 10 to 15 minutes to photograph the plate before it dries. Once it's dry, it's not light sensitive anymore. So that's why it's called the wet plate process, is you actually have to develop the plate. You know, you have to coat the plate, shoot the plate, and develop the plate all before it dries. So, to do this process, you have to have a dark room with you wherever you go, which, you know, was a pretty big thing to carry around in the world. And that's why you see a lot of portraiture made with the wet plate process in, in the 1850s, is because, you know, it was easy to have a dark room set up in your lighting studio. So here's an example of a glass plate negative, a collodion negative on the left, and then what is called an albumin print on the right, which was a, a paper coated in you know, albumin, which is egg whites, which was the glue that had photographic salts in it and then silver nitrate coated over the top. So you would take, you would make the negative in camera, develop it, dry it, and then you would contact print it onto a piece of albumin paper. Later, photographers started making glass plate ambrotypes, and they would take a clear piece of glass and make it into an underexposed negative. And then when you backed the glass plate with a piece of black board, it would flip the image into a positive. So what this photograph is showing is on the right, you have your glass plate amber type that is backed with a black board and it becomes a positive. But on the left, it's, it's backed with a white board and it's a negative. So it's kind of, an, they're interesting little objects for sure. They're beautiful to look at. And so I'm sure most of you have noticed, you know, the wet plate collodion process was the dominant photographic process of, uh, you know, 
the early and mid 19th century, made in the mid 19th century. Um, and it was the photographic process that was used to document the Civil War. And there was a lot of portraiture made. And if you notice, you know, I'm sure we all have seen all of these 19th century portraits, nobody's smiling in them. And we all read that as like, oh, you know, everybody in the 19th century was miserable. Everybody was going off to war and, and dying. Well, in actuality, it was because these processes were so slow. The wet plate collodion process wasn't very light sensitive. So sitters, people getting their photos taken, might have to sit up to, the, you know, two, three minutes for their photo to be, as their photo was being exposed. And it's hard to hold a smile for two to three minutes. It's much easier to hold a straight face. So here's an example of a studio set up for a wet plate portrait studio in the 1960s, or I'm sorry, the 1860s. So you have the little thing that's uh, labeled with the number four. That's a head brace that clamps onto the back of your neck and holds your head still while you're getting your photo taken. So that's the reason why we see those photographs and nobody's smiling. But, you know, the wet plate collodion process was really an, a very important process because it, it was one of the first democratic photographic processes where, you know, it was still expensive to get your photo made, but it wasn't as expensive as, you know, previous processes. It was more accessible. Photographic studios started popping up in every major city. Um, soldiers that were being shipped off to the Civil War could save up their money and get their photo made before they were shipped off to give to their family. And that's often what happened. So the wet plate collodion process also uh, served a really important role in how we as a nation understood war. You know, before the Civil War, this is what we had as, as you know, this and this is what we had to 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 look back at war and like depict war scenes, you know, this painting, this oil on canvas painting, or this oil painting. Well, what the wet plate process allowed was us to actually photograph, or the photographers of the time, to actually photograph what war looked like. So the wet plate collodion process, as we talked about, is a very slow process, and it's a process that you have, a, have to have a lot of equipment for. So it wasn't able to capture the action of war, but it was really good at capturing the aftermath of war. So instead of living with just these like, you know, very patriotic scenes of, of conquest, we, you know, our nation was kind of forced to look at this, like the actual, you know, grit of war. So these are all photographs that were taken in the Civil War. Also a really important thing about the wet plate process was after the war you had a bunch of photographers that were hired to document the war that were now out of work and so what happened is they ended up getting employed or kept their employment with the with the government and were sent west on the surveys of the American West of the frontier and so every one of these surveys the United States geologic surveys to the west had a photographer on staff and they would go and they would photograph these lands that you know no westerner had lived in yet so you know a lot of really important photos were made uh, we decided to preserve areas like Yosemite Yosemite National Park because of you know Congress being able to see these photographs of such a beautiful place um, so photography played a very important role in the American in the establishment of the American West and we talked about that a little bit in the landscape, uh, the history of landscape lecture. But the thing to remember about this is, so these surveys you had these photographers who were traveling out west in these places that were, you know, unestablished landscapes. And these guys had really big cameras. They were carrying all their chemistry with them. Their dark, they had to have a dark room or a dark tent with them. And they had to have all their chemistry and glass plates with them. So these guys were hauling around a ton of stuff. This was by no means an easy job. And so you actually can see in a lot of these images, or some of these images, right here is a Carlton Watkins photo. And you see that white triangle in the photo that the arrow is pointing at? That's his actual dark tent. And so he was, you know, he's up here right now taking the photo. And then once he would take the photo, he'd run back to his tent to develop the plate. Because remember, he had to do all of that in 15 minutes, and so he had to have his dark tent nearby to coat the plate and develop the plate. So 
that's that's it for part one of this lecture, and then we're going to continue on with the rest of history all the way up to contemporary in the next part. So see you then.